Okay, all right, we are in John chapter 4. <clears throat> Don't forget what I told you uh, earlier. It'll be on your test. Oh, uh, never mind. Uh, <laughs> well, I forget where I am so much. Uh, I could give you a test, though. I would enjoy doing that. Uh, this guy right here, Langton, in the 1200s, uh, gave us chapter divisions, and we're stuck with them. And then a fellow by the name of Stephanus in the 1500s gave us verses. And so we got what we got. And we don't always agree, you know, with the chapter divisions or the verses, <clears throat> etc. Now, why, why do I mention that? I mention it because chapters 3 and 4 are so, so closely related in one respect. Now, I think it's a good chapter division because Jesus has been in Jerusalem. You remember that? end of chapter 2, he was doing signs. And then in chapter <clears throat> 3, you remember the one who had witnessed his signs in chapter 2 came to him and was asking some questions. What was his name? Nicodemus. Okay. And <clears throat> Jill, you've moved. Haven't you? Where's Jill? Ah, you've moved. You know, do you know what that does to a teacher like me? I mean, I want to look over there at you. And where's Diana? She's, she's, oh, okay. She's definitely moved, hasn't she? Okay. Anyway, all right, never mind. Uh, I just looked over there and I didn't see you. Um, sorry, I didn't mean to embarrass you. Where are we? Okay. All right, now. Um, okay, Nicodemus came asking questions. You remember Jesus uh, taught him. And then he went into uh, telling about the Son of Man being lifted up like Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. Then he talked about the conflict between light and darkness. And then we had the section uh, that we did not read about John the Baptist <coughs> proclaiming that Jesus would increase, but he would decrease. Okay, now that's the bottom line of it. Um, there's not a lot in that section I could go over. Uh, I mean, I could, but to save time and to move forward, I thought we'd just go into chapter 4. Now, with that, we've got <clears throat> uh, the Lord is going to be making a change here. So you knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself did not baptize but his disciples, and he left Judea. Now, what's going on there? with the Pharisees. You see, it's not until chapter 5 um, that he gets into a conflict with the Pharisees. And he does that in chapter 5 purposefully because in chapter 5 he heals a man who had been lame for 38 years and he does it on the Sabbath. And then in verse number 18, the Jews begin at that point to seek to kill Jesus. Okay, so beginning in 518, all the way through the rest of the book, you know, the Jews seek to kill Jesus. I just think that's really an overwhelming thought. You remember like our first day of class, I mentioned to you that uh, um, frequently in John, if not most of the time, when the word Jews is used, it's used in a hostile fashion. Now in chapter 4, we're going to find it in verse number uh, 22, that salvation is of the Jews, and we'll talk more about that when we get there, but <clears throat> there the word Jews is not used in a hostile fashion. It's more of a neutral, you know, uh, category, okay? But in chapter 5, the hostility begins, and that's really something that we need to remember all the way through, you know, the Gospel of John. It's just overwhelming to me, you know, how <clears throat> all of their encounters... Uh, for the most part, you know, our effort to entrap him, to test him, to uh, ensnare him, and to eventually kill him, which they did. Okay, so the, the point I'm trying to make here is he did not want to get into a conflict with the Pharisees at this time. Okay, he's going to wait and do that as recorded in chapter <clears throat> uh, 5. All right, now. Uh, let's see. So, um, verse 3, he left Judea. 
All right, now you can see on the map here, um, you can see right here on the map, where has he been? He has been, if I can get control of this boy, he's been right here, trying to get him in that star. Okay, he's been in Jerusalem, correct? And he leaves Judea. The word left here is a very, very uh, sharp word. It almost signifies um, he burned a bridge. You know, that's, that's the idea of the word. You can't get that, you know, with, with just the English word left. I mean, like today, I will leave uh, Crossville and I'll go to Baxter. Okay, but it's not like I burn a bridge because I'm coming back Wednesday night, you see. But left here is I've left it. Now, Jesus will return, you know, to Judea, but he's not, a lot of his ministry is not going to be there. He's going to be working, you know, primarily up in, uh, this is so weird because I'm looking for my pointer, you know, I have on Wednesday night. But he's going to go up into Galilee and work up there. But before he does that, he's going to go uh, to uh, Samaria, particularly Sychar. Okay? Now, <clears throat> I think I'll just do it this way. Interestingly enough, uh, <clears throat> frequently the Jews, <clears throat> if they're in Jerusalem and they want to go to Galilee, the Orthodox Jews would go over here to Perea. And then they would go up north, and then they'd cross back west to uh, Galilee. Instead of doing what? Okay, thank you, Jenny. And John, instead of going through Samaria, they hated the Samaritans. How did the Samaritans come to be? Who can tell me that? Do you know, John? When the Assyrians took the northern kingdom, they brought back in some foreign peoples and brought them back into Samaria with some native people that were still there, and they kind of okay. spread. And okay, when the Jews went into Assyrian captivity, a lot of people don't know this, but you can find it in Kings, and I forgot exactly where it is right now, <coughs> but uh, they took the Jews into uh, Assyrian captivity, and so they, what's the word, deported, would that be the word? Uh, moved them out, okay? But there were some that remained you know, in the area, okay? And then the Assyrians imported, you know, some folks, you know, into the area. And then they intermarried, all right? And uh, here's another thing that happened. The, uh, and this is significant for chapter 4, the religion of the Samaritans was different than that of the, uh, of the Jews, their, their worship was more corrupted. They only believed in the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch, and even their Pentateuch was sort of a corrupted you know, edition of the Pentateuch. And they believed that worship was to be at Mount Gerizim. You know, the Jews taught that it was to be at Jerusalem. Okay, Gerizim is right here, see? And <clears throat> there's a lot of crazy things said about Gerizim. You know, that, uh, that the ark never did cover the very top of it, you know, and that um, Abraham made a sacrifice there. And anyway, a lot of, a lot of stuff I've read about. But anyway, uh, so the Samaritans now, they emerge as a result of mixed races, okay, mixed marriages. And then, uh, so, so they are, are not pure Jews. And, and, and their worship is not pure, and as a result, the Orthodox Jews, you know, hated them, okay? Do you know the name Brother Charlie Cole? He is a great gospel preacher from Florence, Alabama, one of my heroes. I worked for him for four years. Brother Cole said one time in a sermon that if a Samaritan sneezed in the direction of a Jew, the Jew regarded himself as unclean for three days. <laughs> I thought that I never have found that documented, but not that I've even looked for it that much. If Brother Cole said it, I accepted it. But anyway, so now, now I'm saying all of that to say this. Here is Jesus right here in Judea. And notice what the text says. <clears throat> the text says that he needed to go through Samaria. I think the King James, this is New King James, I think the King James says he must needs go. Is that right? Okay, same basic idea. 
He needed to go through Samaria. Now, why did he need to go through Samaria? It was not a geographical necessity, you know, that he do it. Because, you know, he could, he could have done this. Okay? But that's not what he did. So then why does the Bible say he needed to go through Samaria? I think it was a divine necessity. He wanted to go through Samaria to make a point. All right, now what have we been talking about in chapter 3? We've been talking about Jesus and Nicodemus. But now we're coming to uh, this next chapter, chapter 4, and we're going to see an incredible contrast here. And as we'll see, I wanted to go ahead and show you this though, but Nicodemus was a Jew versus a Samaritan, a man versus a woman, learned versus unlearned, upper class versus lower class, moral versus immoral, remember she is living with a man, and um, Nicodemus was seeking uh, truth, but this woman was in, indifferent and even flippant. Uh, well, that's my next point. Uh, Nicodemus was serious and dignified, but this woman was not. And Nicodemus was a respected man, and this woman was an outcast. So do you see the point I'm trying to make here about the, the similarity uh, to view, uh, I mean, of chapter 3 and chapter 4, and the need for us to keep that in mind, you know, as we study? Got a comment on that? Anybody? Right. Well, I mean, he certainly indicates that, doesn't it? He's already said, <clears throat> you know, that it's for everybody in words in chapter 3, you know, Son of Man being lifted up and so forth. He learns his men, you know, of course, as Jesus said, you know, give the woman water. So I think that was his way to give an introduction to that group of people. Right. Well, I, in the title of the chapter in my commentary, is Jesus the giver of living water. But notice what I said here. I've got this, sir. Also, his apostles followed that way. Of they were half Jews. You were either a Jew or not Jew. You were a Jew or half Jew, but they considered him not Jew at all. No, Samaritans also, were not Jews. Also, Right. Uh, that, a lot of lessons come out. Not only Jesus, Dennis broke down um, barriers, racial barriers, custom barriers, etc. But notice the next point I made here. I, I didn't emphasize it enough, I don't think. So you have this contrast. You all see it on the screen. And then I put here, both were sinners in need of grace. Okay? All right. <clears throat> now, let's look a little farther here. Uh, so he came to the city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son uh, Joseph. <clears throat> okay, the word Sychar means town of the sepulcher. Town of the sepulcher. And near Sychar is the tomb of Joseph. And that may account for, you know, the name, you know, sound uh, Sychar. But it, it means <coughs> town of the sepulcher. Now notice verse number 6. Uh, now Jacob's well was there. Jesus therefore being wearied from his journey sat thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. Now a couple of things here. <coughs> First of all, uh, let's see. I think I'm going to wait on the comment on the well. Notice you remember that I said in the introductory lessons that um, John emphasizes the humanity of Jesus. You remember that? I think, you know, probably more so than any other gospel writer. I mean, Jesus was hungry. Uh, he was thirsty. Um, he, uh, here he's weary. And, and the word for weary, when I looked it up, I found it means to labor, to grow weary, you know, from work. It, in the tense of the verb, it's in the perfect tense. It indicates a state of weariness. And so what that means is like, I am weary, I have been weary, 
and I remain weary. It's kind of like uh, um, um, in Revelation, I stand at the door and knock. The verb there is in the perfect tense, indicating that Jesus <clears throat> has been standing at the door. He is standing at the door. He continues to stand at the door. You see the point? And so that's the same significance here of the word weary. <clears throat> I've been weary, and I'm still in a state of weariness. Okay? So the point here about Jesus is he's past going. He can't go any farther. But David, aren't you talking about the Son of God? Yes, but I'm talking about God in the flesh. I'm talking about the one who was fully God and fully, what, man. And not just body, but flesh. I'm talking about this. This is what Jesus, you know, was made of flesh. And so being in that state, he became weary. All right. And so he comes to this well and he, uh, he sits by the well and it's about the sixth hour. All right. Now, what is the sixth hour? All right. It's about noon. All right. Don't forget, we're going to stay on Jewish time all the way through the gospel. You know, the first time we heard something about what hour it was, was chapter one. You know, where um, um, Andrew and John, you know, wanted to visit with Jesus. Do you remember that? And it was about the, you, gotta, you need to know this. It was about the 10th hour. Remember, and I told you that was about 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Okay? And then the next day, what did Andrew do? He found Peter, his brother, and told him what? You're killing me. Yay. Thank you, Beth. I appreciate it. All right. Okay. All right. Now, I want to say something about the word well here. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> this is going to be important because uh, in verse number six, you have the word well. You see it? And verse number 14, you have the word fountain. You see that? Okay. Now, it's translated, um, how is it translated in any other versions in verse 14? I have fountain of water. What do you have? Well of water. You have well of water? Okay. Um, say? Yes, we spring. Spring, okay. Okay, spring of water. Okay, now. Here's what I found interesting when I dug into this because uh, the only way you're going to really find out about the significance of, of Holy Writ is digging into these words. The word for well in verse 6 and the word translated fountain, well, or spring in verse 14 is the same word. And guess what it means? It means a spring. It's like you dig a hole in the ground and you hit what? You hit a spring, okay? Now, now watch this. In verse number 11, you have the word well. In verse number 12, you have the word well. And guess what those two words are? They're different words. See, you don't get that in English, do you? You see, you read well in verse 6, and then you read well in verse 11, and you think, well, we're talking the same thing. No, we're not. Well, in verse number uh, six is a, talking about a spring. Well, in verse number 11 and 12, is talking about a dug out hole. Because, see, and that's the reason that she says the well is deep. Now, wait just a second. Okay. All right. Now, here's what's going on Jacob dug this well. Everybody with me now? He dug his hole in the ground. I've been there. I pulled a bucket up. There I am. I drank out of it, didn't I? Maybe not. Yeah, I did. Uh, Cause some people fussed at me, said I shouldn't have done that, but I didn't care. <laughs> I wasn't going to go to Israel and go to Jacob's well without drinking the water. Okay. Maybe they fussed at me because I used my hand. That might have been the reason. I don't know. You know how some germaphobic people are. But anyway, uh, um, Okay, 
So Jacob dug this well. He dug it deep. It's, it's about 120 feet deep. Uh, I think estimates now show it about 100 feet deep, something like that. I said it in my commentary. Any of you read it? You remember it, John? Did I say that? Find that verse. Find that verse about where it's deep. Uh, it's verse number 11, if you will. You got your book there. But anyway, uh, a lot of stuff's been thrown in it over the years and so forth. Now, let me say something else about this well. It is undisputed by all scholars that this is Jacob's well. You know how some liberal scholars sometimes dispute, you know, this or that? It is undisputed by all that this is, in fact, Jacob's well. Now, notice... More than 150 I have more than 100? Okay. Thank you, John. Uh, now, notice... Uh, that's not the way it looked when Jesus and the woman came to it. <laughs> okay? All right? It might have looked more like, you know, some of the wells that some of us my age grew up around. But at any rate, uh, now it's got a church building over it. Uh, now, why has it got a church building over it? Because um, the Crusaders frequently built buildings over, quote, holy sites. For example, when we get to where Jesus' uh, tomb, you know, was, it's going to be under what is called the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, okay? And so a big church was built over that site. Now, I'm thankful that they did this. Why? Yeah, it preserved the site. And, and so... I'm grateful that the Crusaders, uh, you know, built this structure over this well. Otherwise, it might not have even been uh, preserved. But I wanted you to know that about the two different words. And the reason it's important is because when Jesus offers her water, verse 14, he said, well, he offers it to her before that, but he, had, he says, whoever drinks the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up to everlasting life. So see what Jesus is doing here is he's picking up on, um, you know, the things within his reach, as it were. See, like in the parable of the sower, you remember Russell? What did he do? He talked about wayside soil, thorny ground, you know, etc. Things that people were familiar with, they could see and touch. Well, that's what Jesus is doing here. See, see, this woman knows that this well is deep, and at the bottom of the well is what? It's a spring. It's not just water. It's what? It's a spring gushing up. And so Jesus picks up on that idea, and he tells this woman, what I'm offering you is a spring, you know, that it gushes up unto eternal life. Don't you know that must have had, you know, some kind of impact on, on her mind? All right, got any comments so far? Okay, who is it? All right, Garrett. That comes from what? It comes from Halen. Oh, okay. I thought you was talking about a commentator or something. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you are. <laughs> you're, just, you're just in the flesh, aren't you, Taylor? Yeah. Than 11 and 12. 6 and 14 might be referencing the water, and 11 and 12, he's referencing the hole. Yeah. So they're kind of, they're, yeah. You know, yeah. I think that's right because, yeah. see, she says the well is deep. Right. So she's talking about we got this deep hole in the ground. Right. Okay, Brandon? Uh, along those lines, I think we underestimate how arid that region is. Uh huh. Yeah. How much time would it have between Jacob digging the well and then the time of trial? I don't know the answer to that. That that is something that I should know. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's when Jacob lived, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and then all the way from Jacob to the time of Christ. How long is that? Regardless. Yeah. And if someone had water, there would have been a great incentive to preserve that access. Right. Yeah. 
Yeah. Right. That, that, yeah, that's a good point, Brandon. Uh, and notice also how deep the well is. I mean, I know some wells in Mississippi that are not but 20 feet deep. Isn't that crazy? What about wells around here? I guess they're deeper, aren't they? Any of you got a well? Clyde? Okay, Clyde says his grandfather had one 60. Anybody else? Mercy. That must have been on top of... Mercy. That must have been... Well, that just blows my illustration. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Okay. Now, uh, yes, sir. Where, where are you talking about? This slide? Yeah, sanctity of this sanctity of this site. It, it has to do with this site, this area. Kindly show respect for the sanctity of this this site. This area. I you know, I don't know. I got I got about four years of Greek, but I never did study Arabic. <laughs> and uh, to, that'd be. Uh, I was watching some TV program the other day, and uh, some show, and this uh, person that was at the computer. He picked up something. Now, Jonathan, you're a wizard and all you other wizards here. Um, he picked up this plastic thing and laid it on top of his keys. I thought it was maybe some kind of protector. But then when he typed, his English letters converted to Arabic. Well, what's that about? I don't... I mean, that's... Unless he already knew Arabic, which he did... And he was just typing Arabic letters, and that thing he put on these keys was just to protect. I don't know, that but anyway. Was a proper way to drink from a well yes, sir. Yeah, I'm sure they did. <laughs> yeah. Listen, I'm from Mississippi. I've drunk more out of my hand more times than I can count. Yeah. Well, I lived at my grandmother's for years, and I let it touch my mouth because, uh, I mean, I'm not going to hold it. We called it a dipper. I'm not going to hold a dipper out here in the world and try to get water out of it without touching it with my mouth. Huh. Well, best wishes to you. You know. <laughs> yeah. I made sure that I was on the right side of the dipper because she dipped snuff and she drank from the other side. <laughs> and anyway, all right, so there I, there I am. And uh, I have less hair than I thought. My wife said, you know, she, when she cuts my hair, she said, you ought to see what I see. But anyway, okay, now here's another picture. I want you to see this. That kind of, to me, you know, carries the idea of it being deep. And, um, and then this is an ancient uh, picture that they found in some church over there that an artist drew thousands of hundreds of years. That's a joke, okay? Um, we got to sort of work together here, and sometimes y'all don't get my points here. But at any rate, so here's Jesus and here's the woman, and there's the picture. All right, we're going to wait on that next slide. All right, let's see where we are. Now, it was the sixth hour. It was about noon. And notice that the Bible says that uh, uh, a woman of Samaria came to draw water. And Jesus said, give me a drink. Now, why was she there by herself? If you read about, Brandon, if you read in the Old Testament about wells, uh, for example, Moses, didn't he find, you know, some of his lady friends at the well? 
See, the well was a gathering place for the women, kind of like a barber shop for men, or used to be. When I go to the barber shop when I was a kid, there's a bunch of men there that didn't even want to get a haircut. They was just there to gossip, okay? But the well was a place for the women. See, they're the ones that had to draw the water and carry it. And so they were there to catch up on all the latest news. Who's going with who? And did you see so-and-so, you know, out there? And, boy, I think he's handsome. I'd like to date with him and so forth. Of course, they use different language, I'm sure. But it all boils down to the same thing. But where are the women here? Okay, Jenny says this woman may have been ostracized because of the moral situation that she was in. See, she had had five husbands, but and the one that she was with now was what? Not her husband. So she was living with the guy. So it may... I think she was probably a social outcast. And uh, so it got me to thinking, do you draw water at noon? Do you draw it in the evening? And I found, uh, I think I talked about it in my commentary. Uh, didn't Josephus find, me, find it for me? John, I'm going to appoint you my official representative on finding stuff. Uh, does it say in verses 6 or 7? I think I quoted Josephus where he said, um, by the way, Russell, here we go. This, con this relates to your comment on Wednesday night. Donald. 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 Yeah. I called you Russell. Yeah. Why did I do that? Looks like you. I hadn't done that before. <laughs> Who's Russell? Is, do we have a Russell? Where, where is he? Oh, okay. Uh, sorry, Donald. But I remember your point. Okay, between you and Acuff. Okay, no, <laughs> McDuffie. I know it's McDuffie, Linda. Okay, and Emily and Nurse Cratchit. Uh, anyway, uh, Rachel, sorry. Uh, this relates to your point you brought up about Wednesday night. Why You said something to the effect, well, why do we appeal to historical records, something like that? Well, here's a case in point. You find it, John? Still looking. Oh, he's still looking. Okay, but here's the point. If we can find where Jews of this day, you know, make comments about what was being practiced on a social level, you see, that can give us some insight, you know, as to what's going on, you know, you know here. You see what I'm saying? So uh, that's the reason that I appeal to it. Uh, don't see it, John? All right. I think I found a, a, a passage in him. Look at the footnotes and just find the word Josephus, the name Josephus. In verses, uh, you know, five, six, seven, somewhere like that. Okay. Anyway, I think I found a comment where he said that women drew water at noon. Well, if they did, here, listen to this. If they did, they didn't come when this woman was there. <laughs> you see. Okay. All right, now, and so she says, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city uh, to buy food. Give me a drink. Uh, you know, not all of our conversations with people that we study the Bible with necessarily have to begin with religion. As a matter of fact, uh, most of the time, if not all the time with me, they don't. Jesus didn't begin with religion here, did he? You see, for me, Brother Dan, um, and I saw that beautiful car out there. I want to admire it later when I got more time. But uh, for me, it might begin with your car, you see. Or it might begin, if I'm talking to a farmer, it might begin with, you know, what he's farming. And I can relate to that because, you know, what, what I did, you know, as a, as a young man, you see what I'm saying? So we pick up on, Jonathan, if I'm talking to you, if you were not a Christian, it might be, well, one of my best friends, you know, has a track hoe and he does this and he does that. Do you do something similar to that, et cetera, et cetera. Y'all see what I'm talking about? We call it breaking the ice. Our counselors, who's counselor in here? I need to learn who my counselors are. 
Who's the school teachers? Okay, well, y'all counsel, don't you? you y'all might say you're establishing rapport. You, you know, that's what you do before you get to the point, you know. Now, unless you get in a paddle, which I never did get in school. I had friends that did, but I avoided that. And, uh, and that, that principle did not establish rapport. If you went to his office, there was no rapport building. <laughs> it was bend over. Okay, Brother Donald. Yeah. I don't know if that's what Jesus, but a lot of times I look at what Jesus says, I'm sure. how, he, how he communicated with people. Mm -hmm. And here he's asking her a favor. Yeah. You know, but he could have gone out himself, I guess, but yeah. asking her a favor, who's sort of, I don't know what it is, but people want to. Right. People want to help. Yeah. Them. Maybe that's what he's here. I just want to make the point, you don't have to begin with religion. You don't have to begin with, let me tell you about what the Bible says you've got to do to be saved. I'm going to say that's probably going to be the last conversation you're going to have, you know, with that person. Uh, uh, I, I think I'm, it's fair to say that Jesus never did try to win people that he never did accept socially, you know, to begin with. Because we know he accepted everybody, didn't he? All right. Now, um, now what's interesting here about this give me a drink is this. Um, <clears throat> are you ready? What was Jesus going to drink out of? See, the idea here, give me a drink, is, is uh, I want to use your utensil, you know, to get a drink. Now, what's the big deal about that? Samaritan. So what Jesus is saying, Beth, is to this woman, I'm willing to put my mouth on your dipper, your, your cup, your, your container. I'm willing to do that. Now, don't you know that was a shock? And then notice what the, how the woman's reaction is. How is it that you being a Jew ask a drink from me, a Samaritan, for the Jews have no dealings, you know, with Samaritans. Do you, do you get that about, about the drink? You see, she's basically saying the Jews have no dealings. She's basically saying we don't share vessels, you know, with each other. So how is it that you, Becca, you being a Jew, you know, ask of me a drink? See, she's just, you know, shocked, you know, at that. Okay? Yes, ma'am. Um, that's a good question. Um, did the Jews and the Samaritans look differently? You know? It's kind of like if someone came in our assembly and they had a big belt buckle and boots and a hat, we'd say, the guy from Texas, well, how would, what makes you say that? Yeah. Because you have a certain expectation to come to the Yeah. Uh, might have been his dress, you know, I just don't know, Emily, but that's a really good question. <clears throat> uh, anybody else? Jonathan, you got anything on that? Anybody? Brother Dan? Dennis? Anybody? Okay. Uh, all right, now, Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says you give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said, Sir. Now notice, she says, Sir, in verse 11. She says, Sir, in 15. And she says, Sir, in 19. And the word there is the Greek word kurios, which means Lord. But it's not translated Lord here because she's just using it as a term of respect. But when Thomas uses it in John 20, he says, My Lord and my God. It's the same word. But there he's indicating divine significance. Okay? All right. Enjoy it, guys.